Welcome to the Bonsai Mirai YouTube channel, where we educate you on how to do bonsai better and inspire you through creative projects that expand your awareness of the art form. Click subscribe to be the first to know when new videos are added to the channel. You want to know how to make a bonsai? We're going to show you how to make a bonsai, how to make a juniper bonsai. We're here. Let's do it. Easy steps, simple approach so that we have a fundamental backbone to make a bonsai. And this is a series of steps. This is a process. The creation of bonsai isn't a mystery. It's not a mystical pursuit. It's a very fundamental execution of a few pivotal pieces that we've got to understand. Number one, we've got to select that front. Number two, we're gonna go ahead and create some features and add some interest, this being a juniper, and juniper's having a wonderful capacity to express the struggle, life, and death. Number three, structural wire. Once we've made those decisions, we've selected where we're gonna be presenting that tree and we've created character, added that input, added that nuance of age. Now we can set that structure and build the foyer mass, the living portion of the tree around that character. And finally, we take all of that input and we refine it through secondary tertiary wiring, organizing our positive and negative space, presenting the asymmetry of the tree, and really rounding out that pursuit and that process of bonsai creation to give ourselves the best starting point for a future filled with quality bonsai. Here we go. How to make a bonsai, junipers. Now step one of creating any bonsai, and particularly as we focus on the juniper, a juniper bonsai is finding the front. And finding the front seems like, okay, I'm gonna look for the coolest potential location to view this tree from, but inside of that there's pitfalls. We have our own personal bias, we miss things about the tree, nuances, details, points of movement, areas where the base is really powerful and interesting, features that we might not notice unless we go about the cleaning process to take all of the dead, all of the weak interiors, and potentially reduce the overly elongated branches to a proportional length, as well as remove branches as part of the cleaning process that are structurally flawed or do not immediately allow themselves to benefit the design of the tree. Right? So I've gone through just a small portion of cleaning on the front of this. As I rotate, you'll be able to see where that's significantly reduced in terms of its branching and you can actually start to transparently see through the canopy of the tree. But I need to go through the entirety of this and as I'm cleaning, removing things that can't be used, dead weak interiors, crotches, et cetera, I'm gonna be looking at the best base, that thickest piece that's gonna support the visual mass of the tree, that widest point, that most visually stable point. I'm gonna be looking at the best line, changes of direction, different spaces between those angular changes of direction, and different planes, the three-dimensional movement of the tree as well as the movement of the tree left to right. And finally, I'm gonna be paying attention to those special features. We're talking about aspects of the tree that add to the impression of age. And a big part of how to create a bonsai from a juniper is understanding that the branches that might not immediately be utilized in the foyer mass of the tree, to the design of living branches might be a great representation of age if we turn them into dead wood. You're gonna see a lot of cut off branches that I've left the base of that branch intact. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna turn that into a special feature and I'm gonna be watching as I cut branches off and make branch decisions, what pieces might contribute to that to help me select the front. Again, I'm cleaning to be able to see the best base, the best line, and the features that will contribute to an interesting tree that conveys a significant visual age. After the cleaning process, 
where we've removed everything that can't be utilized either because it was weak, because it was dead, uh, because it was in a crotch, or because it was not usable, and not usable based on where it was growing, not usable based on its abnormally large or small size in proportion to the better portions of the tree, better portions of the tree having that better movement, right? We're at a point where we've cleaned away objectively the pieces that will not contribute to the shape of the tree just as a method of getting to the point where we can make a decision about design. Now I actually get to break down the best base, the most stable point on the tree where it intersects the soil, the best line, the location where we have the most changes of angle, spaces between angles, and planes of the trunk, front to back, left to right, and, and the best features. The, the place where we are able to demonstrate the rugged environment and the presence of age in this material. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a rotation so that you can see where we're at, but through objective analysis, we actually are on the completely opposite side of where I anticipated this front to be, and I'm gonna show you how we got there. First and foremost, the front that I anticipated we would be designing from was over here, okay? Now when I say it's over here, this piece on the repotting bench seemed to have a great base, as I show you the underside of this, seemed to have very, very good movement and seemed like it would have some wonderful special features or pieces turned into dead wood by this portion that's hanging off of the container. What we started to recognize after cleaning is there is some inverse taper, there is a perpendicular point of origination out of the container, and in fact, when we objectively analyze the best base the best lines in the tree, and the best location for special features, we actually ended up on this side of the tree. Now our best base, our widest point, was here. This is where we see the greatest amount of trunk in contact with the soil. The problem with this base is it's very two-dimensional to the front face of the pot. We want to avoid two dimensions in the base. We want to have three dimensions in all of our design components. And that's where we rotated here to see the greatest point of contact with the best dimension. I remove this as my best base and I put my best base here. We started to look at the most changes in angle spaces and planes and although it's hidden behind some of this dead wood right now, we have one, two, three, and then four changes in direction with differing, very small space here, intermediate space here, longer space here. And we see this start at the front, move to the middle, end in the back, we will have that crown move forward to re-engage the viewer, create that forward lean that bonsai need to have, as well as to add another change of direction that will further enhance the quality of that line, my best line and my best base. And finally, that third component of where are those special features going to be, the deadwood hanging off the edge of the container, still very visible from here, not two-dimensional, engages with multiple planes, we have these pieces of dead wood that we left on that were on the inside of the trunk that can add to that presence of dead wood and show that age. And we also have this upper straight section, this branch that had no movement in it, was very, very thick and out of proportion to the rest of the tree and cuts across the front of that trunk that moves around behind it and creates an interesting interaction of what will be eventually dead wood and what is the living tissue and the living trunk of the tree. My third piece, special features, focuses on this plane. This becomes our best base, our best line, and our best features, objectively creating our selection of front. Step two in the process of creating a juniper from a piece of nursery stock or field grown material is turning those unusable branches whose living portions, whose foliar mass we've cut off of them, but whose structure we've left behind, turning those into actual pieces of deadwood. And what this entails is stripping the living tissue or that cambial layer and the phloem layer, the bark, that outer covering off of that central core, which is the xylem, which is the heartwood, and which is the backbone of wood, the physical presence of wood itself. We're gonna be removing that outer layer, and we're also going to be using our tools to split the tissue and expose the interior grains of that hard wood to really execute an aesthetic that would show the presence of weathering from the wind, 
from blowing sand, from desiccation of sun, from the presence and crushing and breakage of snow. We're gonna show all of these elements in these formerly living branches as we remove that outer living tissue, we expose that wood underneath and we open that wood up to show that weathered grain and enhance the visual interpretation or impression of age. First and foremost, when we start deadwood, leaving a significant length along that piece is to grab 50% of the tissue with our tool, split parallel to the grain, our, our branches running this way, and expose that interior. This opens the door for deadwood creation as step one. Now I'm gonna take these tips and I'm just gonna peel and notice how effortless it, they are to peel. I even take this long piece and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna peel trying to get it to break. Now if it doesn't break because it was a formerly living branch, I can go ahead and I can split that again. Again, parallel with the grains, take that tool mark away and start that process of pulling, splitting, tearing, and you already start to see that we get a broken weathered tip amassing on this physical piece of wood. Okay, But I don't have any character down in the ultimate base of this, so I'm going to continue to pull these pieces that separate themselves. I'm going to continue to strip down. I'm going to continue to shorten. I'm going to continue to reduce. I might take my scissors and separate a smaller piece, but the process of deadwood creation is sculpture in itself. This is a this is a creative process. This is an exploratory process. How do we make this very routine vascular tissue of a field-grown juniper interesting? We continue to open, expose, break, tear, split, thin, separate, until we have that final aesthetic that starts to conjure up an image of what we would see in the native regions where junipers occur. If you don't have any idea what that deadwood looks like, there are so many pictures of deadwood that you can Google and see and gain inspiration from that can start to open the door to what this can become. But I wanna really spend some time exploring how we pull that aesthetic out of this piece, one single branch at a time until all of the living tissue that exists on that branch is gone and that central wood is exposed. Okay, now one of the things we wanna be aware of when we're creating deadwood is the fact that there is a really beautiful contrast that can be drawn between this exposed grain of the broken area and the smooth, untouched portions that exist. You notice this white tissue, this is the cambial layer on the very interior, and then the thicker white tissue into the green tissue that then transitions into bark eventually is the phloem, or the sugar conducting tissue. This yellow interior tissue, this is the xylem, or the water conducting tissue, this is the wood, and the very central core of this, and we may see a red tint to the core of the internal tissue on some of the oldest branches on this material would be the heartwood where the sap is stored. So when we start to look at this structure, having this smooth, and when we say smooth, meaning we're being very careful in handling this, you'll see where I'm using my finger more than a tool to separate this because it does easily separate when you uh, create deadwood out of living branch. I'm using my finger as opposed to a tool so that I don't mar the smooth surface of that wood. I don't wanna leave tool marks. I don't wanna make it look artificial. In fact, I want to avoid all tool, tool marks as much as I possibly can. And this is where deadwood creation requires a lot of attention to detail and a lot of craft. So now we've taken the time to go ahead and break the tips, open up that grain, and expose that more aged weathered appearance that Deadwood has the capacity to convey. And you can see very clearly that not only did we work the tips, 
but we carried the extension of that down the trunk, allowing the pulling of that living tissue as we remove it from those branches to actually extend onto the trunk and all the way down to the base of your tree. Most fundamental and important thing you want to consider is to always maintain a clear linear path of connection from the roots via this living tissue we left intact up to the branching that exists. And if we can artistically make the decision and execute intentionally, leaving the live vein on the exterior part of the trunk from the front that we've chosen. Our front is here. I see my live vein on the left side here. This is a very important aspect of live vein creation in deadwood creation is making sure that live vein exists on the outside of the trunk here and the outside of the trunk on the right side as well. Position of the live vein is impeccable. Creation of special features has now given rise to an entirely new concept and aesthetic in this tree. We are ready for the structural setting and to begin the actual formation of our foliar masses. Deadwood work is done on the front that we selected, and finally it's time to actually move into the adjustment of the living branches through the application of structural wire. Now structural wire derives its function. It takes effect on the tree at the location that that wire contacts the shoulder or the joint where the branch intersects the trunk. That's the point we've got to really focus on as we apply structural wire. I'm looking to pair branches of a similar girth, this diameter to the same diameter at another location along the main trunk of the tree, and it's through the pairing of branches of similar diameter and intersecting that shoulder that we get the function and allow structural wire to actually do its job and look good while it's doing it. I'm gonna focus on the same angle, same spacing, no gaps, but if you wanna dive deeper into structural wire, take a look at Mirai Live in the library, the structural wiring tutorial. It will teach you everything you need to know and the nuances that go into structural wiring. We're just gonna take this first simple approach and break it down for you step by step. Now, when we're applying structural wire, we understand that we gain function by the wire touching the shoulder of where the branch joins the trunk. But when we apply it, we also want to be considering that we need three things to fundamentally work out in order for our wire to look good and function. Number one is we have the same angle on every single turn. Number two, we have the same spacing between each turn. And number three, we want to have contact. Notice there's no spaces. We want to have contact on every point of the turn with the wire and the branch. That contact between the wire and the branch is what allows the wire to have the greatest functional capacity, okay? Same angle, same spacing, no gaps. Same angle, same spacing, no gaps. Same angle, same spacing, no gaps. This is the mantra of wire, okay? So I'm looking at same angle, same spacing, no gaps, but with this thick wire, how do we get that done? This is structural. This is a six gauge wire that we're applying to this tiny tree. See this tail here? This is my leverage point. This tail of wire, the length of that wire, let me take my arm out of the way. The length of that wire, that's my leverage. I wanna be putting my application hand all the way out here at the tip. Now where this wire contacts the branch, this is my support hand. Notice my thumb is a fulcrum contacting that piece right there, that bend, the inside bend, and I'm gonna be moving my wire in straight lines. Watch how I do this, boom. Now I'm gonna support the top and I'm gonna raise the wire, boom. Okay, I'm still using the length of that, the leverage of that, boom. Okay, now I'm gonna be coming down and my thumb again is at the bottom turn, boom. Now I'm gonna be holding on the side, boom. Now I'm gonna be coming up and I'm gonna support the top, boom. We're always applying the wire in a straight line application to the branch and we're using our supporting hand, which is actually the hand doing the most work, to counter the force, okay? If we're moving to the side, boom. If we're moving to the top, boom. If we're moving to the back, boom. If we're moving down, boom, okay? This hand is supporting and I'm moving mm, against that. I'm moving mm, against that. I'm moving mm, against that. I'm moving mm, mm, against that, okay? The supporting hand has to be working timing-wise in conjunction with your application hand 
We get that contact with the shoulder, same angle, same spacing, no gaps, using the leverage of application hand and the counter force of your support hand, and suddenly structural wiring is very, very realistic for all of our skill sets, all right? I'm gonna continue to apply that structural wire. We're gonna define the apex of the tree. Defining branch, apex, trunk, creates our design feel. We'll circle back to what that looks like once we've applied that structural wire. Every single branch originating from the trunk is a structural branch. And to say that we've finished doing our structural wiring is to say that we've wired each of those branches that originates from the trunk, from the very base of the trunk to the tip of the trunk where we define the extension of that trunk into an actual branch. We've wired every successive smaller piece that originates from that trunk. And when we think about this, the key focus that you need to put into the shaping of your tree is that whatever angle you establish in the initial branch or the defining branch that you set in that structure needs to be reflected and duplicated with the angle of every other branch that comes after that in the setting of your structure. That defining branch, that angle of drop or maybe for a coastal reflection, rise, also needs to be followed by every other structural piece after that to be able to carry the consistency of your design forward and truly execute structural wiring and structural setting on a high level. This is how we form the backbone of the framework for our tree, not just now, but for every successive working in the future, and that's how we make sure that we set a sustainable structure to build a beautiful bonsai on. Step four in the creation of how you make a bonsai, specifically dealing with a juniper, is secondary tertiary wiring to take all of these crazy branches on these structural pieces we've put into position and to organize them, to create a nice flat bottom that's clean on each pad and creates a definition of line and a separation of positive and negative space, to determine the width of the pad, the thickness of the pad, and the style of our pad. And we're gonna utilize this defining branch as the style dictator for every other pad that we're gonna form on this tree. I'm gonna go about the process of using the structural wire also as our backbone for function of secondary and tertiary wiring. When we pair branches in the secondary tertiary model, one wire will follow the structural wire as a guide, the other wire will spin opposite. This seems nebulous, I will explain, but let's dig into secondary tertiary wiring to define the formation and style of our pads on that defining branch and really dig into the technique and the application. Here we go. Now when we go about the secondary tertiary wiring process, again, we're pairing branches that have a similar size, a similar girth, a similar length, a similar wire gauge necessity. And we would say, in general, with annealed copper wire, we wanna be using a wire that is roughly 30% of the diameter of the branch. Okay, now there's a lot of things that influence that. The longer the branch, the next gauge up we need to utilize. The more foliage mass that the branch has on, the next gauge up we need to utilize. But in general, 30% of the diameter of the branch with annealed copper wire is a great starting point for what gauge we would prefer to use. We combined this piece here with this piece here. They were by far and away, when we look at this branch, the two largest and longest secondary tertiary pieces. 
Okay, same angle, same spacing, no gaps. When we look at the application, you see that same angle, 55 or 60, 55 or 60, 55 to 60. The spacing between each turn of wire is similar and the contact of the wire with the branch also executed to a very high degree. And so we say, when we pair branches of a similar size in secondary tertiary branch wiring and pad formation, one wire spins following the structural wire, the other wire spins opposite. And in essence, if we follow that simple fundamental practice, we will always enter the correct side of the branch, we will always have the correct rotation, and that opposing spin of one following structural, one spinning opposite, is what provides tension and function to the combination of my secondary tertiary wire on my secondary tertiary branching. So here you can see a finished out pad. You see the length, you see the cleanliness of the branches along the bottom of that pad. You see where some of these pieces, as I've been dropping this branch, I elevated and just kept them at the level that they occur at. Notice that all of these kind of flattened out. That came with the picking up of that tip. We drop that branch down, we pick that tip up, and it forms the basis for all of our secondary and tertiaries to be laid out in that beautiful fan shape. Now that we've created that central backbone of positive space, it's very clear to see and, and easy to understand the negative space that exists between it. And we're gonna start to build out these subsequent layers as these interior pieces that we're putting into position gain strength, gain foyer mass, and gain density. This is the process by which we set that style on the defining bench. And we're gonna carry this same systematic approach branch by branch as we climb up the tree until we've got all of our branch pads defined, our negative space set, and our positive spaces clearly illustrated and executed. Gotta value these little guys. This is the whole part of making a juniper. How to make a bonsai, you wanna make a juniper? Learn how to wire these smaller guys. Okay, now, watch what happens here. Watch what happens here as I transition. I'm gonna use this hand to hold this wire right here. I'm gonna use the fingers of the same hand and notice the pinch, 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 pinch. And watch how I finish pinch right across the bottom, very nice and loose, branch is not mangled. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna come all the way around, watch closely. Now I'm gonna hold here, I'm gonna blend that, that wire to branch, boom. Okay, I'm gonna come all the way around, watch pinch, pinch, pinch. I'm able to secure, let me go ahead one more to control the tip because it's a weaker piece, pinch, boom, and there I'm in. The pinch, wiring these weaker interiors, this is how you build a more dense branch. We've been placing all of our branching, forming that acute and then out towards sunlight fan-shaped pad flat bottoms and notice the delineation pad to pad in the foyer mass. We've started to establish a lot of really nice definition in between our pieces of green, but we are now at the top of the tree. And in order to understand how we secondary tertiary wire the top of our tree, we have to select the secondary branch that will become our apex. 
I have my natural highest structural element here. I want to be using this in the exact same way I've used all of the other foliar pieces to just form another pad here. That pad, the highest pad on the tree, represents the apex. And when we make a bonsai for the first time, that apical region being flat, being the final finality of that foliar mass, that's all that we're asking of the tree and that's all that we're asking of design. One more pad on the top, I'll subsequently lower these pieces and shorten them and we are at the tail end of our wiring and our styling. Let's finish it off in appropriate fashion. in that apex, you want to keep that length. Watch this, watch this. This is going to form the eventual end of my apex, my, the terminus of my apex as this tree continues to mature. Watch, 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 boom. Notice how I drop that piece up. I don't want to wire it. Drop that piece up, come on back now, come on back. Back, okay. Now I bring it back, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet because I still have this length. I'm going to carry this wire all the way out, all the way out. Now I'm going to drop back down. Mm. There it is. And that, that's what generates, mm, that's what generates that direction right there. As you can see, just by understanding the steps of the process, you can take a very humble piece of material and turn it into something truly fascinating. How to make a bonsai? Start with a juniper and follow the process. Find your front, create that deadwood, set that structure, and organize those secondary tertiary branches into that defined positive and negative space, and you are well on your way to building your bonsai process and starting that tree in the correct direction. If you want to see further information, each of these steps live vein delineation, deadwood creation, structural wiring and setting, secondary tertiary branch formation, apical creation are all videos that exist on the library, live.bonesimerai.com. Start your week free trial, check it out, see if the information applies and if it advances your bonsai process. We look forward to seeing you online, join the journey and wish you all well in your bonsai adventures. Thanks for tuning in. Mwah.